thank you guys all for coming. Uh, this talk is about getting started in OOP and PHP. Um, it's a beginner talk, uh, as indicated on the slide. If you aren't familiar at all with PHP, I'll try and help you out as much as I can. Um, but we're kind of assuming a little bit of familiarity with PHP, probably with procedural code, and you're looking to move into more object-oriented programming. Um, if that sounds like you, then you're probably in the right place. A um, couple times before I started, I've been asking everybody where they're from, and I think pretty much everybody in the room is from Utah so far. Is anybody not from Utah? In that case, everybody in the entire room should get involved with the Utah PHP user group because it's kind of awesome and it's a really good group. And if you're wanting to learn and get better at PHP, that would be a good place to do it. So I am not local. Oh, no. All right. That is now the third time that Keynote has crashed since I've been up here. And it's going to put a damper on things. Bear with me real quick. Let's see if we can get it going again. All right, so I'm from Denver. I'm the VP of technology at a company called i3Logics, which none of you have ever heard of. Uh, I've been coding PHP for quite a little while. Um, I organized the user group in Denver for a long time. Um, and we've now got a new user or a new association geared towards web development in general that we're starting up. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me in IRC at PHP Mentoring and PHP Study Group. So those are another two great groups to go and check out. That's on Freenode. Um, if you're interested in TDD, I've got a couple of essays on tddftw.com that you can check out. And then there's also quite a lot of videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, that were associated with PHP study group. So we would sit and talk for a couple of hours about a topic and just kind of follow where it went. So what we're going to talk about today, yes, it didn't crash, uh, is uh, a lot of terminology that goes along with object-oriented programming. It's not really a difficult concept, but if you don't know what the terms mean, then it's going to be a little bit hard to understand. So we're going to talk about classes and objects and interfaces and inheritance and methods and properties and visibility modifiers and static and constructors and probably a lot of these things are not familiar to you but that's okay because by the end of this talk they will be. Um, so back when PHP started, actually let's get another show of hands. How many people have been coding PHP for less than a year? Less than three years? Five years? Ten years? Anybody over 10 years? OK. So everybody in here, since you started with PHP about 10 years ago, PHP has had object-oriented features in it. But it's not necessarily an object-oriented language. It's procedural and object-oriented, and you use it however it is. So my guess is most of you are writing code where you have a script with a bunch of includes or requires at the top, and then you go down and you fill out some HTML, and you print out a form, and you process the form, and you do your stuff. Does that sound pretty familiar? Yep. Um, so OOP gives us uh, some additional tools and features and functionality that we can use to split that code out to make it easier to understand, easier to maintain, and, and keep track of what's going on. So why bother, though, right? What you've been doing works. Obviously, you've, you know, you're employed, you're doing work, you have sites that work or applications that work that do the things that you need them to do. One of the issues with procedural code uh, as opposed to OOP is this lack of abstraction. So abstraction is a very important concept. Um, imagine how hard it would be to code if you had to keep track of, you know, this wire in the computer has this many volts going across it and it's going into this wire in this integrated circuit which has this I mean, it would be impossible, right? You would not be able to think at a high enough level to figure out what you actually wanted to make the computer do. So our computers are built of layer after layer after layer after layer of abstractions. There's tons and tons of them, right? There's computer engineers that have to think down at that level of the actual electrons flowing across. We get to think about nine or ten levels above that, right, in PHP, which translates all the way down to electrons flowing across wires. So abstraction is a good one. And what we don't get very much of with procedural programming is abstraction. We get a lot more of that with OOP. So think of it as another way. You have your car, right? You press on the gas pedal, your car goes faster. 
that's a level of, of abstraction. You don't have to worry about when I press the gas pedal, it pulls on this cable and that cable pulls this lever and that lever opens up this valve and it causes this or it triggers a thing on the computer which triggers another thing which makes more fuel flow in or however it does work, right? There's tons and tons of things that are happening because you pushed on the gas pedal and all of those things come together to say car goes faster, right? So those levels of abstraction allow us to think on the very simple level of gas pedal goes down, car goes faster, and we can all handle that. It's very, very simple. Developers or people in general can only hold about seven things in their mind at once. And for some people it's significantly less, for a few people it's a little bit more, but it's usually about five to seven things, right? If you go any more than that, you're gonna, you're gonna forget something, you're gonna lose out on whatever it is you're trying to think. So abstraction is a very important tool that we have and we get a lot of that with OOP. Another issue with procedural code is that we have data stores as structure, right? So if you're writing procedural code, you've got all these variables, you've got data structures, and by data structures I mean things like integers and floats and strings and booleans and stuff like that, right? Things that we hold information in. In PHP, we also have another data structure called a resource, and that's defined internally in PHP. Is anybody familiar with resource or ever seen it in PHP? So have you ever done like a MySQL connect and var dumped it? You'll get this thing printed out. It'll say like resource number two or something like that. What that means is it's essentially internal to PHP. It's this object or this structure that PHP is taking care of, and you don't even get to see the insides of it. You don't need to, but it's another, it's a data structure. It's a thing where we can represent a whole bunch of complex things where you as the programmer don't need to worry about that, right? So if you dump the MySQL connect, if you dump F open, you'll see resource. And so resources are used in PHP. They're being used less, they're moving away from them. Um, but it is something that PHP uses and it's something that you likely use as well when you're writing your variables and you're saying this means this thing, right? So the next part is we've got these functions, right? And these functions have to work on these data structures. But they're not related to them, right? When you call F open or you call MySQL connect and you pass in this string, it's not really related. It could come from anywhere. It's not, it's not related to those functions at all. If you pass in the wrong thing, you'll either crash or you'll get some kind of weird thing happening, right? So with 5.3, uh, PHP 5.3 that is, we got namespaces which help a little bit with the global side of it so we can name functions the same thing in a different namespace and we don't have to worry about collisions. But that's not really the solution to how do we get our functions and our data to be related. So this is where OOP comes in. So a class is simply a blueprint, right? Just like a house, it's, it's instructions on how to build a thing. So uh, oftentimes when you're talking about OOP, you're gonna hear class, you're gonna hear object, you're gonna hear all these things. And it's important to understand that there is a difference when people are talking about class and object, it's not exactly the same thing, and we'll get into that more. But think of a class as a blueprint, or a plan for building a thing. Now we could do a blueprint for a car, we could do a blueprint for a web server, or an application, or whatever, but it's a blueprint. It tells us how it's going to look, how it's going to behave, how it's going to be structured. So let's look at what a simple class looks like in PHP. So there's a car. That's legit PHP code. The only thing I'm missing there is the PHP tags. But you could run that and it's going to tell PHP, here's how to make a car. Now there's not much to it. There's nothing in there that would say that this is a car other than it says it's a car, right? So we need more than just this, right? This is the holder. This is the thing that says, what kind of a thing are we building? Well, we're gonna build a car. But we also need the class to do more things. So another thing that a class does is it's going to define state. Um, state lets us have variables in our class that can keep track of certain things for us. And those certain things are associated to those objects, right? Does everybody understand what I mean when I say state? Is that cool? All right. Oh, and by the way, if you have any questions at all at any point in time, just raise your hand. That's completely fine. Um, I don't have this, like, time to the second where if you interrupt me, I'm gonna not be able to do it. I actually expect and, and enjoy being able to answer questions along the way. So if you have questions, just let me know and we'll, we'll go into that. So we have 
this state and they're held in another concept with OOP called properties. So properties are just information and data about the object. They're going to be associated with the object. And I'm using object here even though I haven't told you what object is. Just keep in mind object is different than class, right? So all of these variables that we hold inside of here can be different things. They can be booleans, they can be strings or other objects even, whatever we want to hold that gives us information about what this class is. So let's modify that car class and we'll add a little bit of information to it uh, to give it some state. So we've added two variables in here, an engine and a number of doors. And this is again, legit PHP code that will tell us how to build a car, except for still it doesn't do anything. It just has a place to hold information about an engine and information about how many, how many doors our car has, right? Um, so that's great and all, but that doesn't really give us a whole lot more than just variables, right? These are just variables that are stuck inside of another structure. So the other thing that classes do is they define behavior, right? So this is where we're now associating the data about an object to things that we can do with that object, right? Imagine if you have, uh, never mind, I couldn't think of a good example right off the bat, so let's go on with that and I'll come back to it. So when we attach these functions to a class, we don't call them functions anymore, we, we call them methods, but that's all they are, they're functions, right? So methods are behaviors on a class, they're things that we want this object to be able to do, right? So we have our car, it has information about it, but it doesn't do anything. It's just sitting there holding information about what kind of an engine it has and how many number of doors it has. But we want the car to be able to do stuff, so we're going to add some functionality. So we can add methods, and this is what method definitions look like. So we say, hey, we want the car to be able to accelerate and decelerate, right? So these things change the state of the car, right? If we say accelerate, maybe we have some kind of state that says how fast is the car going, right? We have the speed of the car, or we have how fast are the tires spinning. We could add other methods that would control things like the windshield wiper blades or the consumption of fuel based on how much you're accelerating or being able to open the little door flap over the gas cap, right? All of these things would be methods and behaviors on our car. Right? And they're associated to our car. Yeah? Is, what's the scope of the public is that? Is it within the class or within the... We will, we will cover that in, in just a bit. Um, so I know there's, this, is, this is new. I haven't covered any of that yet, but it is coming up. There's a lot of things in trying to learn OOP that sort of feed into each other in multiple directions. So I tried to come up with a way that introduces the least amount of things all at once, but this is one place where there's another thing that's coming up and we'll define what public is. But for now, just ignore public. Think of it as function accelerate and function and decelerate. And those functions define how the car is going to accelerate or decelerate, right? So we've now built this car. We have a class. We have a blueprint for what is this car going to do. It has an engine, it has a number of doors, it can accelerate and decelerate, maybe it can open the gas cap door, or whatever. So we need to talk now about what an object is. So an object is just an instance of a class. So each instance is separate, right? So if you drive a Miata or whatever, there's a blueprint for how to build a Miata, but your Miata and your neighbor's Miata are different. Right? They're different instances, so those are different objects. They're both based on the same blueprints, the same plans, but they're completely separate. Does that make sense? So the behaviors were all defined in the plan, right? We don't have one car that says, okay, if you press the gas pedal down, it goes faster, and on the other one, it goes slower. The behaviors are the same. They're all defined at the class level, but the instance is different. So maybe one of the cars has a better engine or maybe it has more doors or less doors or a different color or whatever it may be, right? So let's go back. We have our class car and whenever you see the dots, all the things that were in there is just, you know, smashed into it so we can fit on a slide. And now we're creating three new cars. We have a Pinto and a Ferrari and a Jalopy and they are new instances of a car. They are all based off of the same plan, the same blueprint but they are completely separate objects at this point, right? If I drive the Ferrari down the road at 100 miles an hour, the jalopy is still sitting in the driveway, 
right? They're all completely separate. We can act on them differently. We can make them accelerate and decelerate on their own, and the state of those is encapsulated within each of uh, each of the individual objects. Make sense? So, whenever we define our class, our blueprint, we can also define differences in there. Right now, we have no differences, right? We didn't define anything that says th that there's any difference right now between a Pinto and a Ferrari and a Jalopy, but we can, and the solution for this is called a constructor. So a constructor is one of PHP's magic methods. Magic methods in PHP are the ones that start with double underscore, and if you haven't done OOP, you probably haven't run into any of them, but there's 13 or 16 of them, and they do special things, and they're reserved words in, uh, in PHP. So you can't, or you're not supposed to, make your own methods that start with double underscore, because PHP may come along at any point and make their own methods, in which case yours are going to be broken. So we have uh, the new keyword, right? So when we call new car, it says, go look up the blueprints for car, build me a new object, of the car using the information that I've given you about how it's supposed to look and how it's supposed to behave. The constructor is a special function that gives us more control over how it's supposed to look, I guess. So the data can change. Or we can actually do a lot of things, but we don't want to. We want to avoid doing anything in a constructor more than setting values. So we want to avoid doing work, right? So we don't want to, for instance, make the constructor of the car start the car, because then every car that we create is already started. What if we want to make a car that's not started, right? Starting the car would be doing work. But we can do things like setting the number of doors, setting the color, setting the engine, those sorts of things. Those are just setting variables into our car as properties, right? And that's totally fine. The reason why we want to not set uh, or not do work is for testing. Imagine if we wanted to test what happens when a car is off, but our car is always on at the moment we create it, right? Now we've got to do extra work just to get it to the state that we want it. We have to shut it off just to be able to test it. Um, not that we would ever build a car in OOP, but you can imagine with any kind of other thing you might want to build in PHP OOP, avoid doing work in your constructor. So let's take a look at what the constructor looks like. So we have another, uh, another function, it's called underscore, underscore, underscore construct, and we're passing in variables, engine and number of doors, right? Just like a regular function. And then inside of our constructor, we're setting those variables on the object, okay? So every time we call new, it's going to invoke this constructor. It's going to run the constructor and it's going to do whatever is in this function. So we can pass in a different engine or a different number of doors. Make sense there? So let's change our example with the Pinto and the Jalopy and the Ferrari. So now we've got some functions we can pass in. We can say, okay, the Pinto is a two-door with an explodey sort of engine. The Ferrari has a fast engine and a two doors. And the Jalopy is a four-door rusty engine, right? So they're all different. And I'm using strings here to represent the engine. But in reality, we would probably put another object that would be an engine by itself. Okay, so when we go into our constructor, it takes all these variables that we're passing in and it sets them as state information on our object, right? So now the Pinto variable has the exploding engine and two doors. The Ferrari has the fast engine and two doors and the Jalopy has the rusty engine and four doors. The two doors from the Pinto and the two doors from the Ferrari, completely separate. If we wanted to make a Ferrari with five doors, we could do that by passing in five, right? Any questions on this part so far? Okay. All right. So let's talk about one more keyword that you haven't seen yet, and that's the this keyword. All right. This is brand new, most likely, unless you've looked at OOP. What this is, the dollar this, it's a special variable that inside of an object or inside of a class definition, it says, we're talking about the instance that we're running in, right? So if I call accelerate on the Pinto, this means the Pinto, right? If I call accelerate on the Ferrari, it means the Ferrari, right? We don't want to go and press the gas pedal on the Pinto and make the Ferrari go faster. 
we want to be able to deal with whatever uh, instance we're actually in. So this is a special keyword inside of PHP. Uh, it's used, let's see, I think self in some, uh, some languages. This is pretty common in, in a lot of other languages. Um, but then we also use uh, the single arrow operator right after, so the dash greater than. That's how we say we want to deal with something inside of this object. So engine or accelerate or any of those things, if we're inside of this object, inside of the class definition, we would use dollar this arrow to say we want to call this method or we want to set this variable or get this variable out of the object. Make sense? Okay. So now to get back to your earlier question, visibility modifiers. So this is where uh, you notice we've got uh, public and public and public, and then earlier, I don't know if you remember, but we had protected. These are called visibility modifiers. Um, so you've seen the private, or sorry, you've seen public and protected. There's also one called private. Um, so we'll see where we use those. So here's the, the car kind of all smashed up together. We've got a protected on the engine, we've got protected on the number of doors, and then we've got public on the constructor and the accelerate and the decelerate function, all right? So let's take a look at what these mean, right? So public means that this method or property is available from anywhere. And this means any bit of code anywhere. It means inside of the object, inside of another object, outside of any object at all, these things can be ex accessible, right? So it means outside of the Pinto, for instance, we can tell the Pinto to accelerate. We don't have to be uh, a method inside of the Pinto to be able to tell it to accelerate, okay? Um, normally, we want to limit our public methods. This is your API. This is your, your, does everybody know what API means? So slightly different than what like Phil Sturgeon talked about for his API. This is API within your code. It's application program or interface. And it's the functions that others are allowed to call on your object, right? So we would say, on this object, we want you to be able to accelerate and decelerate this car. Um, if you build your classes in such a way that you limit which ones are public, so which ones are accessible outside, then you have less maintenance to do, right? Think of the car example, right? Our normal way that we access it is we have a steering wheel. That's public. We can use it. Even not being part of the car, we can use the gas and brake. We can use the shifter or the, or the gears or whatever, right? Those are all public. The stuff that's hidden away is not public, and we'll get into that more in just a second. So the next one is protected. And protected means it's a property or a method that's available within the class or within its inheritance structure. And this is another term that I kind of need to define here, but I don't have it till a bit. So we'll get back on what inheritance means. But we're limiting where these methods or properties can be ac accessed. So where they can be called, where they can be changed, where they can be read. Um, so in the car example, we made the engines and the door and the number of doors to be protected, right? So imagine if they were public, right? And again, public means anybody can access it. So you're driving down the road and somebody goes, that car should have four doors, and poof, you get four doors, right? Or that car should have a duck for an engine, right? You're gonna have a bad time, so we keep those things protected to limit who has access to deal with them, right? Who, who can change them, who can read them, who can do whatever, right? Um, so if they took our engine and they replaced it with a banana, right, that would probably be an invalid state. But if we built a way to say this car can accept an engine and it can figure out if that's a valid engine, we have a way of making sure that we've always got a valid engine in our car, right? We have methods and, and, and functions that we can use to maintain the state of our vehicle, okay? So we'll talk about inheritance in just a bit, um, but we want to talk about the last uh, visibility modifier, and that's private. So private is available only within the object. So it's even more restricted than what protected has. So unless there's any more questions on, uh, or if there's any questions on visibility modifiers, I'm going to go to what inheritance means. Yes?
Uh, the, the answer is changed through my career. So when you're starting out, you probably don't spend a ton of time, and you end up spending a lot of time rewriting it. Later on, you spend more time in the design phase. You figure out, OK, last time I did this, I had to flip it back and forth and back and forth as I figured out what I wanted to do. But if you have kind of a design in mind beforehand, then that prevents some of that flipping back and forth. And so you spend more time on the design and less time on the code. Later on, some of that stuff becomes sort of second nature. And so you can spend less time on the design and less time on the code. Um, another thing that I've found that helps a lot, and this is not covered at all in this talk because it's way too big for this, is test-driven development. So test-driven development is building your tests, so writing tests that run your code, and then building your code to make those tests pass. So you write your code, you write test code before you even have real code. And when you do that, you find uh, certain patterns where if it's hard to test, it's going to be hard to use. And so you start writing your way, you're, you start writing your way through the code in a way that's easier to test because it's also going to make code that's easier to use. And your interfaces will sort of fall naturally out of that, and, or your API will fall kind of naturally out of that usually. Um, but it, it comes with practice mostly. So, But like I said, try and, you want to try and keep the public methods limited, right? Keep what an object does to a minimum. And only when you're like, OK, this object really does need to do this thing, and I need to be able to do it from outside of this, outside of this object or outside of this class, then go ahead and say, all right, let's make another method for that. Make sense? All right, so inheritance is our next uh, concept. And it's not when your rich uncle dies and leaves a bunch of money. Um, it's a core concept to OOP, though. right? It allows us to build a class that takes on many of the properties and behaviors of another class, and we can then augment or override some of them. Okay? So in PHP, we have a concept of single inheritance. Our class can inherit from one other class. right? And it, in turn, can inherit from one other class. Other languages have a concept of multiple inheritance, so they can actually inherit from more than one class, which leads to all sorts of different problems. And PHP doesn't do that, and we're not going to talk about it. Okay. So let's get more specific with our car. We had our generic car that we can pass in our engine and our number of doors. Um, but we can have more specific things. So we can say, all right, class Ferrari extends car, and then we want to override the accelerate method to make it accelerate like a Ferrari instead of a generic car. And we also want to add in new functionality, burn rubber, right? We want to go really, really fast. So we can put all of this in the Ferrari. And when we build a Ferrari, the Ferrari will have all the stuff that the, uh, the car has, at least as far as the public and the protected stuff, plus all of the stuff that we define in the Ferrari. Okay? It won't have any of the private stuff. And this is where that inheritance thing comes in with the visibility modifiers, right? So if we define something in car as private, the Ferrari will not have access to it. Okay? If we define it as protected, the Ferrari will have access to it. And vice versa, actually. If there is something that we override in Ferrari, and we call that thing within a thing that's only, if we call that method within a method that's only defined in car, car will be able to use the Ferrari's overridden method as well. Right? So protected goes in both directions. So you've got the concept of parent and child classes. In this case, this is the child class, and this is the parent class. So that's the inheritance relationship in OOP and PHP. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and when, you, <clears throat> when you say overridden, you mean you, you use the same method name in the parent and child? Right. So I had an accelerate in the car uh, class, okay. and I've got a brand new accelerate method within the Ferrari. Okay. So, if I call accelerate, right. yeah. So I'm I'm providing a brand new definition for accelerate. Okay. Now I do have a way, and I don't have a slide for it, where you can actually call the parents accelerate or the parent the parents overridden method as well. Okay. Um, but usually, what you're going to do is you're going to provide completely new functionality for an overridden method, plus probably some other functionality. Meanwhile, decelerate works exactly the same way. We defined that once in car, 
It still exists within Ferrari, but we don't have to write it again. We don't have to copy paste it or anything like that. So we can use inheritance for that. All right. So one thing to uh, keep in mind, though, inheritance might sound pretty cool and it is kind of neat, but inheritance is not probably the best way to go about building things in OOP. One of the things we want to do uh, before we use inheritance is we want to make sure that it's an appropriate thing to do. So one of the things I do is I mentally replace the value or the extends keyword with is a. And if the thing still makes sense, when I say is a instead of extends, then it might be okay to use inheritance there. If it doesn't make sense, it's definitely not the right way to go. Okay, so I can say Ferrari is a car. Yep, that makes sense. So it, uh, inheritance makes sense here, right? So let's take a look at um, a few more examples. And the, and the reason why the is a helps me, and I, and, I, and I tell this to all the people on my team, like use is a instead of extends when you're thinking about it, is we want to make sure that if we're going to use inheritance, it's the right thing to do. So let's take a look at some real world examples. Um, I know a lot of the code that you're going to be writing isn't uh, or doesn't have real world analogs, um, but we'll take a look at a few. So we've got cat extends animal, right? So we can think about does that work? Seems like it might. Parking lot extends car. Well, we've got shared functionality, right? We want to be able to park in a parking lot. A car should be able to park, but a parking lot's not a car, right? Dog extends leg, right? So this, this example comes from uh, interview questions that we did for a long time. We said, okay, we want you to build, we've got a leg, right? An object-oriented leg, and it can move and it can stop. And we want you to build a dog, right? And the dog, you should be able to say, come and, and, and uh, come and stay, right? And the dog should do those things. And we want people to build it, right? And a lot of times what happens is uh, the developer starts out and they're like, well, dog needs the functionality of leg, so dog extends leg, right? Not the right way to go. Um, hand roll extends sushi, maybe. Manager extends person, uh, well, maybe. <laughs> Digit validator extends web form. So let's take a look at, at, uh, at what these look like. So if we replace it with is a, cat is an animal, that seems to make sense. A parking lot is definitely not a car, so that's a wrong place to use inheritance. Dog is not a leg, so that's also a wrong place to use inheritance. Hand roll is a sushi, yeah, I guess. Um, now, coming up with an object-oriented sushi hand roll seems a little odd because I don't know what sort of behavior you might have on a sushi other than like sit there and be delicious. But so we'll say maybe, right? It's not definitely wrong, but it's not definitely right either. Uh, manager is a person. I would say most of the time that is the case. Um, Digit validator is a web form. Well, we, wanna, we definitely want to have validation in our web forms, right? But a validator isn't a form. It's a thing that we're going to use within a form, right? We're going to have all of our elements in our form, and we want to validate those elements, but we don't need to make our, va our validator be an actual form, OK? Does this make sense so far? So because of uh, that dog extends leg thing happening so much uh, in the interview, uh, we had uh, one of my coworkers ended up drawing this on his iPad during it, and this is what I think it would look like if uh, that was actually the inheritance relationship that was the case, right? And this is not at all <laughs> what should be proper, right? All right. Apparently, I've copied the same slide in here twice. We'll go right past this one because we already talked about all of it. All right. So encapsulation is a term that I have used a couple of times in this talk, but it was another one that probably didn't make a lot of sense. So encapsulation is essentially data hiding. It's or hiding information and hiding functionality from the user, right? Or from the programmer. Now, at first glance, that might sound like a bad idea, right? We want to expose as much functionality and as much data to the programmer because they're going to know what to do. Well, there's a lot of power that comes with hiding that functionality, right? Imagine, again, if you're driving your car and you press the gas pedal and you have to keep in mind that when the gas pedal presses, it pulls this cable and it does this stuff and it pulls this cord and the gas goes in and the car goes faster and you have to know all of these things. And not only does the gas go faster, but it injects the pistons and the blah, 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 and it all goes. You wouldn't be able to get out of the driveway. There'd be too many things to think about and to make sure that things were going on, not to mention 
with all of those things being accessible, what's to say that you don't accidentally replace a piston with a banana, right? Your car's going to have a bad time and you're going to have, uh, you're probably going to have to call in late for work. So the reality of it is encapsulation, hiding data, hiding functionality is used everywhere, right? Our computers are insanely complex. Most of that complexity is hidden away from us, right? We get a keyboard and a trackpad or a mouse and a monitor to interact with our computers, and we're able to do all the things that we need to do without having to know how many volts are going across this particular trace in the circuit board or anything else, right? So encapsulation is a really, really, really good thing, and hiding data and hiding functionality is a really, really good thing, right? What it allows us to do is change that hidden functionality, and as long as it behaves the same way, we get better behavior, right? So imagine we say, all right, we have a car. We swap out the engine for a better one, right? Now our car behaves better, but I don't have to know how to, I don't have to relearn how to drive it. All the things that I needed to know in order to drive it are exactly the same as they were. It just goes faster or it breaks better or whatever, right? So encapsulation is a very, very, very good thing. We want to hide as much functionality and as much uh, data from outside of that object as we can. That allows us as developers to change how all those things go together without breaking things for everyone else. Okay? Make sense? So hide your stuff as much as you can. That's why I was saying back in the beginning with public, we want to make sure that you only make things public if they absolutely need to be. Right? If you know that somebody's going to have to call this functionality from outside, fine, make it public. But if not, Start with something like protected or private, okay? So our next concept is called an interface. And an interface is commonly named functionality. They provide in PHP a way for us to define the methods that a class has to, def has to have, but not any of the functionality, okay? So we have all sorts of real world analogs for interfaces, right? The gas pedal and the steering wheel are interfaces, right? All of our cars have those things, right? I should be able to go and get in anybody's car and know how to drive it because all the stuff is going to be in the same place and it's going to act the same way, right? If you decided, well, in my car, when you turn left, the steering goes right, somebody's going to have a bad time, right? It might be you when you get into somebody else's car and, you know, you crash. Um, this is an interface, right? This plug is an interface. It's also encapsulating things, right? If we took the outlet, the outlet plug or cover off the wall, Right? Behind there, we're going to find some wires. Right? We're going to find a red wire and a green wire and, or a, a black wire and a white wire, whatever. I don't remember the colors. Right? But each of those wires has a specific purpose and a specific color, but they're wired in here in such a way that it's almost impossible for you to screw up when you're plugging in something. Right? If it was wired differently, then your alarm clock's going to have a bad time, your vacuum cleaner, whatever you plug in, is going to have a bad time. So we have these interfaces where we say, okay, this big hole in the bottom, always going to be connected to ground, right? The little hole is going to be connected to live, and the big hole is going to be connected to neutral. And that's how it is, right? And we have additional things on the interface that say, okay, well, what if I have a plug that doesn't need ground, right? Well, we have this one's tall and this one's small. So if you had a plug that cares about which way you plug it in, you can't plug it in backwards because it's going to have a tall, a tall side and a small side, right? And if you flip it around backwards, the tall side doesn't fit in the small side and it goes, eh, this doesn't work and you can't plug it in and nothing, no fires happen. You flip it around. Now USB has come up with a way that you have to flip it around three times, I think, before you actually get it plugged in properly. Um, I don't know how they did that, but it seems to me that there should only be two ways to plug it in, and one of them is correct, but somehow I always have to flip it three times. So an interface is also a contract, right? It's a contract between whatever code is calling our stuff and whatever code is being called. So in our car example, our contract is here's your steering wheel. If you turn left, the wheels turn left. If you turn right, the wheels turn right. If you push on the pedal on the right, the car will accelerate. If you push on the one in the, in the left or the middle, depending on how many pedals you have, it will slow down, right? We have this contract. When you jump in a car, you know that's how it's going to behave. Now, this example, this interface, 
This is a United States interface, right? Which is happy, fun times for everybody in this room because nobody's outside of the country, but other countries have different interfaces for their plugs, right? And ours don't fit in them, okay? But as long as they have this interface, we should be reasonably assured that it's going to work, right? So interfaces are important because they allow this common language and they allow for a common API between different classes, right? It allows us to drive the Ferrari with the same knowledge we use to drive the Pinto, to drive a bus, to drive whatever it may be. So let's take a look at an interface. So this is an auth interface. This is a, a very simple uh, interface that would say, how would we authenticate a user, right? And all I'm saying here is we want to define that something that's able to authenticate a user is going to have a method on it called authenticate. And it's going to be a public one. And then in here, uh, we're doing a return uh, doc block. There's nothing in, the, in PHP right now that can enforce that until PHP 7 comes out. But if you put that in there, it gives the person who, or the developer who's calling this a good idea of what to expect, right? If you get back a Boolean that says, yes, it was authenticated, or no, it wasn't authenticated, they can use your authentication class in place of whatever else they may need, right? If you, if you break that and you say, well, I'm going to return a string, or I'm going to return a different object, they're probably expecting that you follow this interface, and they're going to have a bad time, right? So return values on interfaces isn't something we can deal with uh, strictly in PHP until PHP 7. Does this make sense so far? Okay. So let's take a look at a specific instance of, uh, or a, a class that implements this interface, right? So we have this class Bob Auth, right? And it implements Auth interface. And we say that up at the top, and it, and it allows PHP to say, okay, if you said implements Auth interface, then you have to, have to, have to, have to have public function authenticate somewhere in your class definition. If you don't, PHP is going to fatal error and it's going to tell you that you are not implementing all the things that you need to implement. As far as how the rest of it works, we haven't defined that. So we get to define it however we want. So in this case, we also put in a set username. We have a protected username. And when we build this Bob Auth uh, in, or class, or an object of the Bob Auth class, we're going to call in set username. And then our authenticate method is going to determine if you're authenticated by checking the value that you put in and seeing if it's equal to Bob. And if it is, then you're authenticated. And if not, you're not authenticated, right? So pretty dumb authentication, but maybe it's for you know, a club of people named Bob. And that always has to be public? Yep, because, because it's defined in the interface. And, and that's the other part. So in interfaces, um, public is all you're going to see on any of the methods that are defined there, right? Because you're defining, you're defining the interface. Right? We don't want to go and say, hey, in order for you to have a car interface, you need a steering wheel and a gas pedal and a brake pedal, and also you need to have fuel injection. Because now we've, we've made it so that all these things that don't have fuel injection, that use a carburetor or whatever, break this interface, and they're no longer cars, right? or they no longer conform to the car interface. It's none of our business how they actually make the car go, other than we need steering and we need gas and brake. Does that make sense? Kind of, yeah. It's 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 kind of, yeah. It's the contract, right? It's saying this class will definitely have the stuff that's defined in the interface. So you can you can rely on it being there, right? Even if we don't know if this is a Bob auth or a, a Frank auth or a Sue auth or whatever, or just a regular authentication that uses a database or whatever, we know for sure it will have authenticate, and we can call that, right, from outside of it. Does that make sense? Is it defined as public in the interface? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's oh. defined as public in the interface. And again, you will only see public defined in the interface anyway. You can only define public methods in there. There's no reason to define anything else. Um, when I've learned about interfaces, the only, because I spend a lot of time on the operation side of things, I deal with a little bit of code, but the real, only real world example I can understand of using an interface is if you're writing code, Mm -hmm. Applying your code, you would write an interface to force them to use certain structure format yep. for that. Is that really the only use case for an interface, or what's the? Use well, it case? yes, but okay. like if it presented that way, it sounds bad, but it's not. It's really, really powerful because instead of saying you have to pass in 
this specific authentication class that goes to Facebook to authenticate, or this specific one goes to the database, the developer can easily swap this out, or even at runtime, we can swap it out for something else. So now, all of a sudden, if we have our website is able to authenticate using an, authentic an auth interface, we can swap that out or at runtime it, with anything, right? So we can say, let's, let's check all of these different kinds of interfaces, right? or not interfaces, these different kinds of, of classes. So we'll first check and see, are they a Bob? Yes or no? Okay, they weren't a Bob, so let's check Sue. No, they weren't Sue, let's check Facebook. All of those things can be used inside of that method or inside of that function, right? Because we can, and, and I'll get to that in like two slides, I think, of, of how you actually use the interface besides defining your class. Can you have more than one interface on a class? Yes, you can. Yep. So that's, that's another powerful thing uh, that you don't get with inheritance that you do get with interfaces is you can implement as many interfaces as you want, whereas you can only extend a single class. Okay. Um, I think we already talked on this one. Oh, no, this is slightly different, right? So let's say now we want to slightly modify this. So instead of uh, only authenticating if, nope, it's the next one. There we go. Nope, sorry. Getting confused, there we go. So we can now build this one. This is the all Bob auth, right? So this can be used in any place where our Bob auth was used or any place where auth interface is used, but this one will authenticate anybody whose name is Bob, no matter how they spell it, or not how they spell it, but how they, uh, you know, if it's upper or lowercase on any of the, uh, the values. We extended Bob auth, but we overrode the authenticate method. Now in this case, this class still implements that interface even though we didn't explicitly say it because anything you extend, you get those things, right? Including the interfaces that they uh, implement. So all of the other stuff, the set username that was already on the Bob auth comes over and it's in all Bob auth as well, all right? Does that make sense? All right. So how would we use this? So let's say we just have a normal function is authenticated and I can pass in this auth interface right here. And that's where that power comes in, right? Because any of these auth, uh, anything that implements auth interface can be passed in there. And if it doesn't implement auth interface, we can't pass it in there. So we know that we're going to have this authenticate method on whatever it is that happens to be passed into there. I don't care how it's implemented. I don't care if it's Bob auth or all Bob auth or Facebook auth or database auth or whatever. I can pass that in. We can do this check and say, hey, are you authenticated? Get back of an answer, yes you are, no you aren't, whatever it is, right? So just by changing what class we passed in that implements this interface, we've given ourselves all sorts of, of, of power and functionality, right? Imagine building a class that's built up of many, many different auth classes and it just goes through one at a time. We could pass in that one class with all those things smashed into it and it can go through one at a time and, and do this. This code doesn't need to change at all. Right? Does that make sense? All right. So if we type in an interface, we need to make sure that we're just using methods on the interface. You notice in here we're not using set username because set username was not in our interface. We're just using authenticate. It's up to the caller to figure out how to put that object together in the way that it needs to be put together. Okay? I have about two minutes, so we'll go a little bit quick. Um, so static is the next uh, concept. Static is uh, with a method or class, or sorry, it's a method or, man, I, I, yeah, property is what I meant to say here, and I proofread these and I still missed it. Method or property available at a class level, we don't need the object, okay? So it's functions that are defined in our class, but you don't have to create an instance, right? And because of that, let's take a look at it, we can't, because of that, we can't use the this keyword because there's no object instance, right? We're now talking about the we're talking about the blueprint essentially, right? We're saying, okay, we have this class called house and it comes with one door and we can set the number of doors. If we change that, right? And I made this uh, this is essentially public, but we can we can access it this way or we can access it through this function here. Either one of those things is now going to change the number of doors that all of the houses have because there's only one place that keeps track of that and it's right here. So every single instance of the house has access to that variable but it's shared between all of them. 
just like every single instance of the house or even outside of the instance of the house has access to a set number of doors, it's not tied to an individual instance. So we would never build a house like this, right? Does this make sense? Static is something that I would say you probably want to avoid using mostly. There's a few cases where it's good, uh, good to use, very few. Mostly avoid it. Um, it makes it hard to test. Um, and if you're interested in more about this, I go into it a bit more tomorrow in my intermediate OOP talk, which is at 2, I believe, in this room also. So you're welcome to come to that one. Um, we got a couple more concepts to go over, and we'll wrap up here. So the next one is, Sorry, just yeah. Quick question on that. So when you are calling that method on this, or calling that change on that static uh -huh. function, that changes the number of doors for all instances of that. If the houses are using that variable to figure out how many doors they have, then yes. If they have their own uh, non-static variable, then they would have their own set of how many doors they have. Um, but it, it would change, let's say your constructor, for instance, said, whenever you call the constructor, you build a new house, we're going to get the number of doors that the house is going to have from this value, right? So if you changed it using, uh, and it was a static variable, the next house you created would now have that new number of doors and every subsequent one until you change that again. So it's, it's something that you probably want to avoid. It's, it's almost like a global, and we know globals are bad, right? Globals are bad? Okay. Um, all right, so the next bit is abstract classes. And this is, uh, it's a class that allows us, uh, we can define functionality, we can define properties and methods, but you can't instantiate this kind of class. So it's like a, it's sort of the blueprint, but you can't build anything from it. The entire purpose of an abstract class is that you want to extend it and build off of it, okay? So, Let's say we have uh, an abstract class here, username auth, right? And we're providing functionality. We say, okay, you've got a username variable, you've got a set username, but how you get the username, you have to define that. So we've defined a function that must be defined in our child class. We've defined the fact that this is an abstract class here, so you can't instantiate this thing because it doesn't have all the functionality it needs, but it does provide some of the functionality, okay? So, Let's take Bob Auth from before, and we're going to implement it using this abstract class. Okay, so the same functionality we had before will come in through Bob Auth. So we extend username auth, and this is what it looks like. So essentially what we've done is we didn't have to define the username. That was already defined in our, in our abstract class. Sorry, I think you dropped a, I'm not sure what, but something fell down. Um, We've defined that there. We define our get username here because our abstract class didn't define it, right? And our authenticate is still defined here as well because that's all dependent on the stuff that we need to use. But our functionality, some of our shared functionality like set username and the fact that there is a username came out of that base or uh, parent rather abstract class, okay? So by itself, the abstract class doesn't do any good, but if we extend it and we fill out the rest of it, we can have good things come from it, okay? Any other questions? Because that's all I got right now. Yeah? Yeah, so um, the, the constructor magic punch you talked about. Uh-huh. Um, so in your example, you had that defined as public. Yep. You would never call that. You so don't call it, that you don't call it directly. It gets called automatically when the new keyword is used. If it's not defined as public, you can't create new instances of a class except for if you use a, like a static within the class. So if it's, not pu if it's public, you can call it from outside of the class. If it's protected or private, you essentially have to be in that class or in that class's inheritance structure. Yeah. So that's, um, there's a pattern called singleton. It's not a great pattern because it essentially makes a global, but it's a pattern where you say, I only want there to ever be one instance of this thing ever. Right? Maybe it's a database connection or something that you want to share. And in those cases, you do define your constructor as protected or private. And then you also provide another public static method that can call and create that instance when it needs to. Otherwise, it gives you back the thing it already created. Okay. But just using a normal identity would show up as a public function, even though you're not there, you're going to call it. You're always going to call it new. Yep. 
Yeah, and you don't you don't define the constructor in your interface either because a different uh, class could define the constructor differently, right? Um, so this I don't know how many uh, of the people you've talked to have, or the the talks you've seen already have put their joined in link, but uh, I would really appreciate it if you go there and rate this talk. Um, the URL's right there, or you can zap it with your phone and it'll go there too. But uh, this is very, very, very helpful and useful for speakers to get feedback on how their talks are going. It helps with the people that run the conference as well to pick talks to show up at, at this conference or other conferences as well. Um, if something worked for you, we like to hear about it. If it didn't work for you, we like to hear about it so we can tweak it and, and work the talk differently. So if you would, please do go ahead and, and go to joined in and, and, and rate this talk and rate all the other talks that you've seen and all the talks that you will see. So thank you for coming. <laughs>